Don is one of our counselors, and, and he's up next, and it's my pleasure to introduce him. Don DePetty is currently the Health Sciences Distinguished Professor and Special Assistant to the Provost for Health Affairs at the University of South Carolina and at the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Columbia. He's board certified in internal medicine and clinical pharmacology and has a specialist certification in hypertension. His major areas of research, which have been consistently funded by the American Heart Association and the National Institutes of Health, include pharmacologic treatment of hypertension and the role of novel neuropeptides in the pathology of hypertension. Don is SMA's counselor from South Carolina and he had lots of great ideas yesterday. Um, we, maybe we can share our, uh, our uh, ideas as you go. Thank you, Don, for being here. And uh, we appreciate your update in hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Let's give Don a hand as he comes up. Well, thank you very much. And I want to thank the committee uh, for the tremendous uh, invitation, not only to be one of, one of our counselors, uh, but more importantly, to be here with you this morning. A uh, couple disclaimers. It's seven o'clock in the morning. I hope you're a whole lot more awake than I am. So if I stumble a little bit for about five or 10 minutes, bear with me. Oh, listen to, listen to the chairman, the taskmaster. It is a pleasure though to bring, uh, at least to start the morning, uh, at least with cardiovascular uh, disease, uh, a, a real serious disclaimer now. I am passionate with, about what I'm gonna talk to you about. I have spent uh, uh, my entire career uh, thinking about vascular biology, vascular medicine, hypertension, and I chose to do it from a, from a primary care perspective. I'm an internist. I didn't become board certified in cardiology or endocrine or nephrology, etc. although it was enticing. They're wonderful, wonderful fields, uh, but my heart never left being a, being a general internist and, and being a primary care physician, so uh, I actually think that way, and I'm passionate about that way. Uh, even though, yes, there's numerous articles on my CV regarding, you know, this gene and that gene. Uh, really, where I've started and where I've stopped is, uh, is with you this morning. It is appropriate this morning uh, that we actually combine uh, two major cardiovascular risk factors, of course, hypertension and hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia together. And it's also appropriate, and it's just timely, this year. Uh, because within the last 12 months, as we know, Two major guidelines have been released by two differing bodies of cardiovascular, public health, lay, uh, and public uh, experts uh, in, in two distinct panels. And they've been a little, they've been discombobulating uh, in, in some regards, uh, and it's changed. Uh, some of our paradigm thinking, some of it we, want, we may accept, some of it we may reject, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it has been a very interesting 12 months. My charge is to try to review those, uh, those guidelines with you this morning, but more importantly, since we already know the guidelines, they've already been published in pre prestigious journals, uh, let's discuss them. Let's talk about them, because as you're going to see, at least with one of these entities, and I'll already spill the beans, it's hypertension, we're not done. So let's start with hypertension first. Hypertension guidelines, well, where are we in 2014? I clearly thought that we would have reasonable answers by now. The guidelines would be reasonably set. We might still be debating around the fringes, you know, this recommendation or that recommendation. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And there's a little bit of history here as to why, uh, that we're, we're still going to be discombobulated. And this is pretty much hot off the presses within the last, I'd say, two to three weeks. The JNC committee, the JNC 8, which is what we're going to discuss, which is the committee report, that's our most recent report that was published in JAMA uh, earlier this year, has been the, you know, not the, not the, the, the Bible group, not the, the gospel group, but pretty much the unifying group to bring disparate guidelines, even within this country and abroad, from Europe, Canada, et cetera, and has been the recognized, or pretty much the recognized body of consensus around hypertension guidelines, and it's appropriate, uh, and it's deserved, because it was founded by the National Institutes of Health uh, way back in the 1970s uh, as a consensus committee, and it's behaved that way up until recently. 
J and C8 will be the last J and C8 because as, you, as many of you know, the National Institutes of Health within the last two years pulled the plug on J and C8 and not, uh, in deference to the way we've been conducting other guidelines in the cardiovascular realm, particularly around the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology, two organizations that are dear to my heart. Uh, so we're gonna, see, uh, we're gonna see change. We're also gonna see a new committee formed. There's gonna now be a new, com there has already been a new committee formed by the American Heart Association and the American College of Clinical Cardiology uh, to revisit the hypertension guidelines uh, for uh, this year into well into next year and hopefully we'll have a, another consensus report next year and we'll just see what they say, what, what they look at. It, that may be appropriate. My guess though is, is that there's not gonna be any new data. It, I'd be, I would be surprised if there's landmark trials that are published within that period of time. So I think today is even a more appropriate time for us to look at the data, look at the evidence-based medicine that the JNCA committee reviewed, graded, scored, and put into their, uh, their recommendations, because I believe that's gonna be pretty much the same data that the new committee is gonna be looking at as well. So I'd like to deputize all of you this morning and I'd like to, all of us now to be one group to look at the evidence based around hypertension, see where we've come from, where are we going, how the JNCA committee used this evidence based medicine to make their recommendations. And also, it will, also, it will already prepare ourselves for looking at the, the evidence based medicine together for the committee report from the American Heart Association and the ACC that hopefully will be forthcoming sometime next year. In, in 2015. And there may be complete consensus and agreement, and there may be disparate recommendations, who knows. But we can look at the exact same evidence this morning and evaluate that evidence and become familiar with that evidence. Because it's like the old Fram oil commercial, I'm old enough now, it's pay me now or pay me later. But we're gonna use that evidence-based medicine uh, in our, uh, not only in our reading of the literature, but in our practices. Another disclaimer. I'm full of disclaimers this morning at 7 in the morning. All my cartoons come from my mother-in-law. And this is no exception. My mother-in-law lives in Houston, uh, Texas, where I spent 14 years and in Galveston at the University of Texas Medical Branch, where I met my wife and, and my mother-in-law. And my mother-in-law sent me this uh, many years ago, actually. And my understanding is it came from the Houston Chronicle uh, and probably was drawn by a lay cartoonist. And it sort of sets the stage. The provider's telling the patient, well, Bob, your blood pressure is extremely high. And of course, Bob says, whatever, doc, I take everything with a grain of salt. Well, it reminds me of a couple things. Number one, we're gonna talk about hypertension and hyperlipidemia this morning, but we don't treat these risk factors in a vacuum. We also treat them, of course, with obesity, family history, smoking, et cetera. So even though we're gonna silo them, and, or apparently silo them, we know that that's not the way we practice. And also, we're gonna talk about pharmacologic therapy but also, it also reminds me to, to never be remiss and say that the foundation, obviously, is lifestyle modification and non-pharmacologic therapy, there too. And we can discuss that if you wish. And I'd be happy to discuss that. But more importantly, after I looked at this slide for about five or six years, I came to realize there's something else about Bob than, his, than extremely high blood pressure. My understanding is that the cartoonist probably drew Bob in the likeness of the average Houstonian. Well, the average Houstonian is obese. It's the number one prevalent city in the United States for obesity. And what does Bob have? He has central obesity. So not only does he have extremely high blood pressure, he undoubtedly has a, cl a cholesterol, uh, a dis you know, dyslipidemia, accelerated atherosclerosis. He either has or he's working his way to type 2 diabetes, et cetera. And of course, he has the metabolic syndrome. And again, that puts the risk factors clustering together. Well, the most frequently asked question I get asked even in my local communities uh, in, in Colombia is, why do we even need hypertension guidelines, Don? We are all practicing hypertension. We know it's epidemiology. We know it's target organ damage. We know it's risk factors. And we know if we lower the blood pressure, we're doing good. Yes. However, this is the data why we still continue to need evidence-based medicine and evidence-based medicine guidelines as much as possible. It's because despite our efforts over the last 30, 40 years, in my lifetime, hypertension has been detected, understood, managed, and now, and now effectively treated. That's all in, our, all in our lifetime. This is not a 100-year-old disease. 
This is a 30, 40 year old disease. It's astounding when you think about it like that. But this is the reason, despite all the efforts, and even though we're making substantial progress, this is from the NHANES data, Brett Agin uh, from MUSC at the time, uh, published this report uh, in 2010 in JAMA. Brent's now with us at University of South Carolina in Greenville. Uh, now I'm proud to say. But the bottom line is, despite all of our efforts, safe, effective pharmacologic therapy, patient education, physician education, public health education, we're still only controlling 50% of our hypertensive population with a blood pressure of less than 140 over 90. So that is why we still need guidelines. Even if we don't need guidelines to effectively tell us how to manage the patients, it keeps us in our forebrain. It keeps us in, uh, right, up, right up front and it, it plasters it against the, our thinking that yes, this is something that we're still, although we've come a long way, we are still only halfway down the field. Well, how did we get here and where are we going now? Since we are going to talk about JNC8, it actually is interesting to learn some of the history about JNC8. JNC8 was one of the first, if not the first, I don't, re I don't quite remember uh, specifically, but it has to be one of the first national committees that is, was established by the government, this, you know, our central government, to tackle a major and new public health issue, and that was hypertension. And again, that was in our lifetimes. It was in 1977 only that the first JNC1 report was published. That's astounding when I think about that. Um, this is the systolic blood pressure classification, as you can see, how the JNC8, and up to JNC7, and now we're going to add JNC8, how we've marched down the field with the ball, and how we've changed. Interestingly enough, in JNC1, JNC2, and JNC2 is 1980, there was no recommendation to treat the systolic blood pressure, as you can see. So then, of course, in JNC3 was the first time systolic blood pressure hit the radar screen. And systolic blood pressure at that time was 160. And as you can see, of course, the blood pressures have lowered. We've simplified it with JNC7, and we added prehypertension. Significant changes and significant advances that paralleled our understanding of the, of the pathophysiology of a blood pressure elevation. Well, that was systolic blood pressure, but almost all of our evidence-based medicine, even to today, has been based on diastolic blood pressure. So the diastolic blood pressure has been a little bit ahead of the systolic blood pressure, you know, as they raced down the field. And again, this is the JNC reports over the, for, from one to seven, looking at our diastolic blood pressure classification. So JNC1, JNC2 had diastolic blood pressure as hypertension, whereas systolic blood pressure there was no recommendations or no mention of. But again, even diastolic blood pressure, look what the normal blood pressure was in JNC1, and then JNC2, of course, lowered it down to 90, but it was 105. So we've come a long way. And again, it's progressively, uh, had, we have, have had lower definitions, lower targets, and again, prehypertension has been added. So this shows a little bit more of a simplistic movement towards lower blood pressures, more simplified staging and adding prehypertension to our thinking process regarding our hypertensive or our, our patient in our practices with a certain blood pressure. Now let's go ahead and review how we got to where we are and what the JNC8 committee was charged to do and what were their recommendations and more importantly, why? What was the evidence for these recommendations? Because they're different. If they were the same, we wouldn't be worried. The second most frequently asked question I get asked was, why did it take so long? Why did it take seven, you know, five, six, seven years for the JNC committee to publish their report? Well, we're dealing with the government and we're dealing with multiple agencies, but it's appropriate, it's appropriate uh, due diligence, et cetera, but this is the process. Well, it starts with, you identify an area, this is hypertension, you pick an expert panel. You have to vet that panel with conflicts of interest, et cetera. That takes time. Then you have to develop something new. JNC8 started something new, as well as the hypertension gu guidelines with the AHA and ACC. And that was the charge was not to write a book chapter about the disease process. The charge was to write critical questions, narrow it down to about three critical questions around that field and answer those three critical questions with evidence-based medicine as much as possible. So remember that was the charge. Three critical questions and evidence-based medicine as much as possible. 
So you develop the questions. You look, you search the literature. You, you abstract the data. You grade the literature in terms of the evidence basement. A, B, C, one, two, three. Then you make recommendations. And then everything grinds to a halt because you develop the drafts. You submit, you, you vet the drafts with multiple organizations. And then, of course, you finally disseminate the guidelines. And it takes time to do all of that, especially if you're going to do it diligently. And I believe the committee did. If these three questions are going to be so sen sentinel or seminal, how are they selected? That, indeed, also was a process. It started with the chairs and the members coming questions. They asked others, experts in the field, what questions would they like answered. They pile them all together. They came up with about 20, about 23 questions. They narrow it down to five. And then they vote. And the top three are the three questions that are selected. Also important in terms of due diligence is what populations are we going to include? Well, JNC8 is adult guidelines, 18 and above. They're not pediatric, and they're not early adolescent guidelines. They also included other uh, concomitant disease states, like diabetes, uh, it's, you know, renal disease, uh, et cetera. And they also included special populations. Ethnicity, race, age, where appropriate, and where evidence-based medicine existed. Then you have to develop the outcomes. What are you going to measure? What are you going to assess? And of course, this is cardiovascular disease. It's hypertension. So it's going to be the cardiovascular outcomes. MI, mortality, end-stage renal disease, dialysis, angioplasty, angina, et cetera, stroke. OK, let's go. Let's look. What were the three critical questions that the JNC committee came up with and then addressed? The first question was, where do you start? Where are we going to start the journey? Are we going to start the journey in Destin? Are we going to start the journey in Birmingham? Are we going to start the journey in Norfolk? Where are we going to start? So again, among adults with hypertension, remember it's guidelines for adults, does initiating blood pressure pharmacologic therapy make a difference and if so, at what blood pressure level should we start the journey? When do we initiate therapy? Let's look at the data. I was hot out of my fellowship training at Boston City Hospital and Boston University Hospital in my internal medicine. And I actually did, I did a fellowship in, in hypertension and vascular biology at BU. And I went to Pittsburgh. And that was my first faculty appointment, was at the University of Pittsburgh in Allegheny General Hospital in the Department of Medicine and the School of Public Health. And I was silly enough to ask the question, what's the optimal diastolic blood pressure, because again, we were diastolic blood pressure centric uh, at that time, for the average American? Well, I called the National Institutes of Health. They didn't know. I called the Heart Association. They gave me my first grant. I'm very, very thankful and always thankful to the American Heart Association. They didn't know the answer. I tried the Kidney Foundation. They didn't know the answer. Well, I was in Pittsburgh, and I went to dinner with one of my neighbors who was a CEO of a major corporation in Pittsburgh, and he just kind of, you know, I'm new, he's, I'm young, he's a little older, wiser, more wisdom, and he's just asking me, Don, what do you do? And I said, well, I treat blood pressures for a living, and I don't make much at it. And he said, well, what keeps you up at night? I said, you know, it's funny you ask me, I've been, this question's been gnawing at me. What's the best blood pressure for, an, for the average American? for morbidity and mortality, you know, just, you know, injury, organ damage, and just dying. And he said, he thought for a nanosecond, just a nanosecond, and he says, have you tried the life insurance companies? And I just like stopped in my tracks. I said, what are you talking about, the life insurance companies? He said, we're, you know, you just came from Boston, right? I said, yeah. He says, what's the two largest buildings in Boston? What are they, anybody know? the Prudential Building and the John Hancock Building. And he said, what are they? I said, life insurance companies. He says, they didn't buy, build those buildings for nothing. They built those buildings with money. And he said, there it is, 1983. This is the actuarial data that the life insurance companies have had largely since 1950. And here's the diet based on diastolic blood pressure. 100 is your average risk of an American, of a, mor of a morbid event and based on your diastolic blood pressure. And they knew, so starting, you know, whatever, so there's your 70 to 120 or greater, there's an exponential risk of morbidity, straight out of the life insurance actuarials. 
and the excess risk crosses at a diastolic blood pressure of 83. That's my, that was, I thought that was my answer. Well, it was half the answer. It was, a, it was new data to me. I was astounded, I was surprised, and I was excited. But it didn't mean you, can, you pharmacologically lower the blood pressure and you improve the risk. It just meant this was the population-based data. And then I started thinking, how does the life insurance companies build those buildings? How do they make all, those, all that money? Well, first of all, the data has to be right because they're, you know, they're betting their whole stock you know, holders on the data, on the actuarial analysis. They charge you more for the excess risk. I learned a lot about life insurance companies. But they don't give you your money back if you have better risk, the lower. Notice if you're lower than 83, you have lower than expected morbidity. Well, they don't give you your money back for that little tail, and they charge you more for the excess risk. And this is roulette at Las Vegas. So there's the double zero and zero on roulette. They win every time. And that's, their, that's the profit margin in there. That's kind of interesting. Nevertheless, remember 83. That number's going to come back. But the critical question back to it was, where do we start? What blood pressure what level do we treat? If we pharmacologically treat the blood pressure, we do good. Well, the VA stepped up to the plate. In the 1960s, the veterans were being ravaged. They're returning veterans from World War II now, and even as recently as Korea, the Korean War. Um, were having strokes, heart attacks, MIs, etc. Their VA was the first organization to do a, a, the, the very first uh, landmark trial. Notice what blood pressures they picked. The starting diastolic blood pressures was 115 to 130. And they took one group of veterans, they only needed 70, and another group of 70 veterans, and one they treated with placebo, and one they treated with antihypertensive therapy of the day. Primitive, but effective. Lowered the blood pressure. You don't need statistics. There's not a statistic in this paper, in JAMA. You just need this data. Antihypertensive drug therapy, look at the zeros. And stopped at least the morbidity and the mortality in this study in its tracks. But again, very severely elevated diastolic blood pressures. So this is our first data. So we know that lowering diastolic blood pressures of 115 to 130 does good with pharmacologic therapy. But of course, that's the extreme. Remember the life insurance company slide. Well, the, sen the landmark trial, of course, then was in the 1970s into the 80s, um, was the HDFP trial published in 1979. Uh, and again, the HDFP trial was the first study to look at a target of a diastolic blood pressure of 90 or greater. M most of the patients had 90 to 104 diastolic blood pressures or mild hypertension at the day. And of course, one group of of the individuals was sent to their practicing physicians. There was no recommendations to treat the blood pressure at the day, but some physicians were lowering blood pressure and some weren't. But the other group was sent to the, the universities, the research centers, of course, and they were aggressive. They were told to lower the blood pressure to less than 90, and that's the, uh, that's the step care uh, bar, the gray, if you will, and the referred care bar is the red. And the idea was is that the the specialized centers would lower the blood pressure to a greater extent, and they did, and we'll see what happens. Well, what happened was good things. As you can see, total deaths were reduced, all cardiovascular causes of morbidity was reduced, stroke, MI, uh, and ischemic heart disease. And really, it was this study that was the initial study that was reviewed in the earlier JNC reports that then set the target of a diastolic blood pressure of 90. Well, the JNCA committee has new, newer data uh, and newer population-based data, and they looked at this data, and this is the data that put forth a recommendation for prehypertension. So they did deliberate about blood pressures lower than 90. And as, it, as you can see by Vossen's study in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the early 2000s, 2001, it was now obvious with population-based studies that if you look at patients with an optimal blood pressure, and that's 120 over 80 or less, as you can see, the lower line, both men and women. And if you, see, and if you look at blood pressures uh, higher than optimal, but still lower than 140 over 90, there's a graded increase in, uh, in cardiovascular events. And JNC8 looked at this data. Unfortunately, there isn't a study or there isn't evidence-based medicine that purposely lowers the blood pressure in these ranges to see what, the outcome, what, what outcomes would be. And so for this reason, JNC8 
although looked at prehypertensive blood pressures again, and the SPRINT trial is now ongoing. We may have this data at some later date, but the data was not available. So JNC8 did not feel that they could make any recommendations, or there was evidence-based medicine to make recommendations for blood pressures less than 90. So what did they, what was, what was the answer to question one? In the general population, younger than 60 years of age, and that's going to become important, initiate drug treatment at 140 over 90 or greater. Interesting that if you go strictly by evidence-based medicine, the only strong recommendation can be between 30 and 59, because there is no data from 18 to 29. But they said you can go down to 18 years of age by expert opinion. And of course, it's a strong recommendation. And for systolic blood pressure, it's still expert opinion, because none of the evidence-based medicine trials was based on initiation points of systolic blood pressure. They were based on diastolic blood pressure. But in all fairness, the systolic blood pressure went along for the ride. And we have those numbers. So I think that's a very, very fair recommendation, and it's no change in terms of JNC7. Question two. If question one was where do you start, question two is where do you stop? If you're going to stop, if you're going to start at greater than 140 over 90 in the general population, how low do you go? Where do you titrate that blood pressure down to? What's the optimal blood pressure reduction to achieve favorable outcomes? Well, let's start with the general population, because here's where the special populations now intervene as well. In the general population, which is average Americans, the one study that we need to review this morning, and will give us at least some guidance regarding evidence-based medicine, is the HOT trial, the Hypertension Optimization Treatment Trial. This trial was very different than any others in the previous to its, uh, to its development. It asked the question, not which drug is best, not, where, not which number do you start. It did ask specifically, the question is, what's the optimal diastolic blood pressure to achieve if you're going to initiate antihypertensive therapy? And they took about 17,000, 18,000 people. And to achieve the, the results they wanted, they wanted to display diastolic blood pressures of these 18,000 people over a range of diastolic blood pressures, purposely. Because that's how else you're going to be able to tell. So they took one group and they said, one third of the patients, they said lower the blood pressure to less than 90. A second group, they said purposely lower the blood pressure to less than 85. And the third group, they said to the investigators, purposely lower the blood pressure to less than 80. But the idea wasn't so much the three groups. The idea is now we will have a splay of diastolic blood pressures across a lot of people. And hopefully we'll, it will be, have enough power to determine if there's outcomes that are appropriate. And at, at what diastolic blood pressure? Oops. Well, I already showed you the results to save time. This is what they received. The average baseline blood pressure was about 105. So if you started with 105, as you can see here, and you didn't lower the blood pressure at all, well, you didn't get any improved cardiovascular risk because this is reduction in risk on the y-axis. If you started at 105 and you went down to 100, 5 millimeters of mercury, you had 5% reduction in events. 95 was about 10. If you reached 90, it was about 22. 85, it was still lower at about 27. And wow, it leveled off. After 85, there did not appear to be any further benefit of lowering the diastolic blood pressure in the general population. If you do some fancy statistics, you can determine the optimal diastolic blood pressure. And what do you think that number turned out to be? 83. Darn those insurance companies. Are they good or what? Yeah, just by coincidence, it could be coincidence. Because remember, population epidemiology doesn't make evidence-based medicine for, redu for purposely reducing the event you want to reduce. But nevertheless, in this case, they were congruent. And it's important to remember that there was no further reduction in the general population after reduction, after achieving a, a diastolic blood pressure about 85 millimeters of mercury. So what did JNC8 recommend with that evidence-based medicine? They recommend that in the general population, younger than 60, you treat the blood pressure. Remember, you start at 140 over 90 or greater, and you stop at lower than 140 over 90 or greater, assuming, assuming that if you're lowering it less than, less than 90, you're probably going to achieve a diastolic blood pressure of 85 or less. And that's the assumption. So that's the recommendation. 
Again, only in the ages of 30 to 59 is it evidence-based. Is it a strong recommendation? The systolic blood pressure and other ages are still expert opinion. But nevertheless, they did use expert opinion appropriately. So that's, in the general population, where we start and where we stop. Now what about special populations like diabetes, renal disease, and our elderly population? Let's first talk about diabetes. J and C7, remember, or urged us and recommended that we start at 140 over 90 in our diabetic population and we try to lower the blood pressure to less than 130 over 80. So that's what, you, that's what we, were, we were practicing and m many of us may still continue to practice that. But let's look at the evidence that JNC8, the JNC8 committee reviewed. In the HOT trial, remember there's 18,000 individuals, there were a significant number of diabetics in the HOT trial. And they had that, we have that evidence based. And here's the data now on the diabetics. Remember in the general population, the diastolic blood pressure seemed to level off, or didn't seem, it leveled off at 85 or less in cardiovascular event rates. Well, the diabetic population did behave slightly differently. So here's the three, I showed you the three groups now, not just the, the, the blood pressure reductions. And this is the blood pressure reductions that were achieved. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and they're gonna become important. So here are the three groups. Remember I said one group, oops, I apologize. One group, the target was lower the blood pressure less than 90. Another group, 85, and another group, 80. And here's the blood pressures that were achieved. So indeed, the less than 90 achieved 85. The less than 85 achieved 83. And the less than 80 achieved 81. Those are the actual mean blood pressure targets that were achieved by the three groups. And here are the event rates. Now this is opposite, I apologize for that, but uh, up now is good. So here's the major cardiovascular events, I mean, excuse me, up is, is, is the events, and obviously then at 85 you had events, 83 they were less, and 81 they were, they were further reduced. So the diabetic population continued to, to have lower events down to a diastolic blood pressure achieved of 81. Whereas remember the, in, the, in the general population these, were, these leveled off, these two bars would have been equal if we go back to look at that slide. That's the evidence-based medicine. Then there was another trial that JNC8, a newer trial, could, that could look at, and that was one that did purposely uh, look at a standard blood pressure reduction, less than 140 over 90, and a very aggressive blood pressure reduction, less than uh, a systolic blood pressure of 120 or less. And now this was a systolic blood pressure target, targeted study, and of course this is the ACCORD trial. So that was what the, the, the ACCORD trial asked that specific question. Is aggressively lowering the blood pressure, in this case the systolic blood pressure, but the diastolic blood pressure went along as well, going to, going to well, what are the, what's the outcomes? Is there going to be better, the same, or in fact are we going to do harm by aggressively lowering the blood pressure in diabetics? And they achieved the goal. This is the standard therapy, less than 100, uh, uh, they were uh, asked to lower the blood pressure less than 140. And of course that was achieved, it was about 135-ish on average. And the, the intensive treated group did achieve blood pressures, a systolic blood pressure of around 120, a, a highly significant reduction in blood pressure. So they did what they, they were supposed to do. The study achieved the goal. What was the outcomes? I would have bet you anything that the intensively treated uh, blood pressure reductions would have had improved outcomes. And those outcomes would have been probably across the board. That didn't happen. What happened was there was, there was no significant difference in the combined cardiovascular event rates between the standard treated diabetic population and the intensively treated diabetic population. With the small exception, and I want to be absolutely fair because I am concerned a little bit about this data, although it's small and it's a subset around stroke. There appeared to be a, a significant reduction in stroke in the intensively treated blood pressure, re, re, systolic blood pressure reduced diabetic individuals. But again, the study as a whole, with, which was the, the primary outcome was combined cardiovascular out, out points, there was no difference. So that's the evidence based. We can look at it for ourselves and make our own decisions. So what did JNC8 re recommend from the HOT trial data and the new ACCORD treated data? For diabetics, 18 years or older, start at a blood pressure of greater than 140 over 90, but stop at a blood pressure of 140 over 90. So this is a, this is a small paradigm shift. 
because presently we were under the, uh, under the, at least, the recommendation to reduce the blood pressure to less than 130 over 80. But there was no evidence to support doing that in our general diabetic population. That caused a little bit of a stir. And you would have thought of anybody, it would, be, it would be our endocrinologist, our diabetic associations, that would have been a little bit nervous. They actually went along with the, with the recommendations, at least the ADA did. However, I put this other opinion, well, that's my opinion, that other opinion. I still think that if you want to make sure that the diastolic blood pressure is less than 85. I think that's a fair, that's a fair statement. And JNC did, did not go into that granularity, but I still would like it lower into the 80s. I'll bet there's not evidence-based medicine to drive the blood pressure less than 80 at this point in time, with the exception, possibly, potentially, of stroke. Let's turn our attention now to the kidney. Again, similar to diabetes, JNC7 was recommending a blood pressure reduction of greater of less than 130 over 80. And if you had proteinuria, drive the blood pressure down even further to less than 125 over 75. But let's look at the evidence-based medicine. You've got to go way back now. If you really want evidence-based medicine, you've got to take what you have. And this is really the classic trial, uh, published in 1994 in the New England Journal of Medicine, the MDRD trial. Many of us grew up with this trial. Uh, and it was a trial that purposely reduced two things, intensively lowered the blood pressure in patients with moderate to severe renal insufficiency, and also dietary protein restriction, if you all remember those days, where we thought if you, hyper, if you give protein load, you filter protein, you may worsen the kidney. A very fair, fair hypothesis at the time. So it tried to do two things. It accomplished the goal. It took two different levels of patients with renal uh, insufficiency, GFRs of less than 25, and another group GFRs of 25 to 55, maybe stage three-ish, if you, if you will, by today's nomenclature. Two different levels of protein intake, although that's a different, we'll see the data, but that's not the major point I want to try to make. But more importantly, they did aggressively treat the blood pressure in, in one of, half of these groups and standard treatment in another. They achieved the blood pressure. They did mean arterial blood pressures, but I did some arithmetic. Uh, 140 over 90 was the standard group, and 125 over 75 was the intensively blood pressure reduced group. Pretty fair. And they randomized about 850 people. Well, what happened? Well, interesting, nothing. The protein restriction didn't make any difference. In decline in GFR, if you can see, this is the GFR rate over time of the two groups. They're overlapping. And neither did the blood pressure reduction. With the exception of later in the trial, there appeared to be a little bit further, um, there would be a further decline in the standard treated blood pressure, but put another way, there appeared to be a slowing of the GFR decline in the patients that had intensive blood pressure reduction. But as a whole, if looking at the, over time, there was no difference between the two groups. So in general, intensively lowering the blood pressure in the MDRD trial didn't make a difference in preserving renal function. However, there was a confounder, and that confounder is interesting, and that's proteinuria. In individuals that had, that had mild proteinuria, uh, less than 250 milligrams or even less than a gram per day, there was no difference between the intensively lowered blood pressure patients and those with standard blood pressure reductions. But indeed, as you developed more severe proteinuria, one to three grams per 24 hours here, and nephrotic range proteinuria greater than three, there was a, 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 a slowing of the decline of the GFR, if you will, in the patients that had significant proteinuria with more intensive blood pressure reduction. So the initial results was there, that GFR loss was reduced uh, to a certain extent or to a, to a small extent in the MDRD trial with intensive blood pressure reduction, but this was predominantly, if not entirely, seen in the individuals that had moderate to massive proteinuria. And they followed the study up for 10 years later. That, that data was consistent. However, there's also confounders because now ACE inhibition and angiotensin receptor antagonists became available, and we know they do preserve uh, GFR in type 2 diabetics, and many of the patients, as you would expect, and we're ple pleased to see, were on renin angiotensin inhibition, which is obviously a confounder of the blood pressure reduction. However, there was another study 
that was purposely uh, done. We have known, uh, and we still do not know the pathophysiology, but African Americans have more intensive target organ damage, particularly the kidney, for any given level of blood pressure compared to Caucasians. So there was a, there was a purposely uh, proposed study and performed an eloquent study called the ASKS trial, which is African Americans with kidney disease. These were African Americans with hypertensive kidney disease because they were biopsied. So it took out other, other etiologies of renal disease. It was hypertensive uh, renal disease. And again, the same question was asked. Is intensively lowering the blood pressure going to be better than standard reduction in blood pressure? And the protocol was almost identical to the MDRD trial. The achieved blood pressure in the conventional group was 140 over 85. In the intensive group was 128 over 88. So the goal was achieved. However, the, re the reduction in blood pressure, the intensively treated reduction in blood pressure, did not appear to reach the composite endpoints. It did not preserve GFR and stage renal disease uh, compared to the usual blood pressure reduction group in this African-American population with biopsy-proven renal insufficiency. However, like the MDRD trial, proteinuria came out again with flashing lights. If you had significant proteinuria, the intensively treated group did do better. If you did not have significant proteinuria, there was no difference. So that was very, very similar to the results that was seen in the MDRD trial. So armed with this evidence-based medicine, including newer evidence-based medicine, what did J and C8 recommend? For adults that are 18 to 70, uh, if you will, with CKD, again, stage 3 CKD or greater, less than 60 um, mLs per, uh, per minute, the systolic blood pressure is 140 over 80 to start. And the systolic blood pressure, I'm sorry, 140 over 90. And the systolic blood pressure is 140 over 90 to stop. Differs than the JNC7 recommendation, which said drive the blood pressure down to 130 over 80. I would put the caveat in, if you have significant proteinuria, greater than a gram a day, certainly greater than three grams a day, the more aggressive treated target of 125 over 75, in my mind, is, is entirely appropriate. Probably the most controversial recommendation was looking at the evidence-based medicine in our older population. And the definition of elderly, according to Don DePetty, is one day longer for every day I live. So it just can just great. I'm, I'm just perfectly fine every day. I'm matching that definition. The evidence-based medicine is more uh, flush, if you will, in our elderly population, surprisingly, because we have known the association with systolic blood pressure and adverse events for many, many years. The first study, of course, was the SHEP trial, the systolic hypertension in the elderly trial. This was a bold trial that took two groups of elderly individuals greater than 60 years of age, and one group they treated the blood pressures with placebo, and one group they treated the blood pressures with diuretic-based therapy to lower the systolic blood pressure. That was the goal. And they did that. It was based on systolic blood pressure. Both groups started at about 170 systolic blood pressure, if you will. The placebo group, incidentally, the blood pressure did go down. The systolic blood pressure went down to about 155. A lot of that's re regression of the mean, serial blood pressures, maybe placebo effect. Um, that's why you do placebo controlled trials. But the active treated group went down significantly further to a systolic blood pressure, and this becomes very important. Uh, blood pressure is about 142 to 145 over the course of the study. Diastolic blood pressures went down too, but that was not the target. But you, do, you also do lower the diastolic blood pressure. And the, uh, the obvious question was, does this further blood pressure reduction of the systolic blood pressure make a difference? And of course, we're all aware of the astonishing results and positive results of the SHEP trial, which said unequivocally, yes. Lower the systolic blood pressure in our, great, our individuals that are greater than 60 years of age because look at the benefit in stroke, coronary heart disease, failure, all cardiovascular disease, although mortality was not reduced uh, in the SHEP trial. So no question, and that's where the recommendations first came, to treat the systolic blood pressure uh, and obviously uh, uh, that it's safe to do so and actually significantly beneficial. Those were individuals with, that were greater than 60. What about our very elderly individuals that are greater than 80? 
We now have evidence-based medicine that says the same thing. The HIVET trial took patients that were greater than 80 years of age, and one group they treated with placebo, here's systolic blood pressure, and one group they treated with pharmacologic therapy, and this was ACE inhibition-based therapy with diuretic therapy as well. Systolic blood pressure started again around 170, 172-ish. The placebo group did go down to about 158, but the active treated group went down further to about 150, 148, 150 over the course of the trial. Diastolic blood pressure went down as well. What, was there a difference? Did we do harm? No difference? Or did we actually do be have benefit? And the answer was absolutely. So even in our very elderly, so lower the blood pressure with pharmacologic therapy and remember those targets of systolic blood pressure. They, were in the, they, they ended up in around the, 140, the low 140s, if you, know, if you will, and they started a greater than 150 systolic blood pressures. And of course, dramatic reductions, including mortality for the first time. So, armed with the SHEP trial, and there were others, the cis your trial, there's a Chinese trial, that has absolutely identical results. And the Valhef trial, our very elderly population, JNC8 made recommendations, and they're different. But they're different because they were asked to examine the evidence-based medicine. What were the blood pressures, where did they start, and what, did, what blood pressures were achieved? And I showed you the numbers. So what they recommended is, in, in adults that are greater than 60 years of age, initiate pharmacologic therapy at blood pressures greater than 150 over 90. That's different, because JNC7 said your systolic blood, pr your blood pressure initiation should, age should not matter. It should be 140 over 90 for everybody. So they raised the recommendation to 150 over 90 because that was the evidence-based medicine. So if you're going to start there, where do you stop? And the evidence-based medicine showed us that the achieved systolic blood pressures were not lower than 140. They were 142-ish, 143. So they recommended lowering the blood pressure. If you're going to start less than over 150 over 90, stop at less than 150 over 90. And that's a change. And that's, that's presented some consternation, if you will. Because, again, it's, it's evidence-based, but it's probably counterintuitive to many of us that are practicing medicine. But if you're going to ask for evidence-based medicine, you can't have it both ways. That's, that, and that's the current recommendation. As I said, this is controversial, and there was another committee from the American Society of Hypertension that said, keep the same recommendations from JNC7, and an equally appropriate and prestigious body. And hopefully we'll have the tiebreaker with the new committee that has just recently been formed. Okay, last question. We talked about where do you start? Well, where do you stop? Well, how are you gonna get there? Is there an optimal, are there optimal antihypertensive medications versus others? In other words, what car are you going to drive on this journey? What's the brand of the car? Or what's the class of the car? Coupe? Convertible? Sedan? Corvette? Sports car? Yeah, let's do that one. How are we going to get there? This brings me back to my, some, sort of my heritage. We've come a long way since step care therapy. This is the very first documentation of the concept of step care therapy by doctors Kiefer and Wilkins from Boston University. And here's the step, their first drawing of step care therapy. I don't you can read this, but you start with Relwolfia, then you add Veratrum, Proveratrine, which we still don't know how in the world it works. Uh, you can add Hydralazine as a third agent, and then if all else fails, don't let the patient stand up. Use ganglionic blockers. The purpose, though, is, is that although we've abandoned step care therapy and its practice of starting with only one, with one class and heaping on others, the theory of step care therapy is still absolutely critical to our understanding. And the understanding is use differing classes together, not from agents within the same class. And that was actually the, the concept of step care. And this is obviously written to, to Dr. Trebanian, Aram Trebanian, my mentor in Dr. Trebani went on to be president of Boston University, but it's interesting history. This is the study we have to look at for, for evidence-based, because this study was actually designed to answer that question, which car are we going to drive? Which antihypertensive agent, if any, are better than others for the United States population, the general population? 
And that's the All Hat trial. I was privileged to be the principal investigator of the Tomes trial, the treatment of mild hypertension trial, when I was in Pittsburgh that led to the All Hat trial. And the, we, the, the first trial, the Tomes trial, was proof of concept that we could do it because you could give one drug about 80% of the time and maintain that individual on that one drug. Nobody thought that was possible. Uh, and the All Hat trial, again, then duplicated those results. Three cars were chosen. Uh, this was an NIH-sponsored trial, uh, if you will. A diuretic chlorthalidone, a long-acting thiazide. An, an CCB, amlodipine, uh, again. An ACE inhibitor, lisinopril. And an alpha blocker, doxazosin. What's missing? One reason why I was a little, I was disconcerted regarding the All Hat trial was in the Tomes trial, we had a beta blocker group. We had a fifth group. But the All Hat trial did not because of cost, whatever, availability, manufacturing. But there was no beta blocker treated group in the All Hat trial, and that's a problem. Anyway, we found out something very remarkable. In an antihypertensive trial with pharmacologic therapy, you can do harm. And of course, the doxazosin arm was stopped summarily by the safety committee. And it was stopped abruptly because the safety committee is evaluating the data, blinded, and they're saying some of these people are having greater strokes and greater incidences of heart failure. And when they, they, they did unblinded the, the data, it turned out to be the doxazosin group. So from the first recommendation to come from the all -head trial, we do not use alpha-blocking agents as first line monotherapy for the treatment of hypertensives. That doesn't mean you throw out the baby with the bathwater. That doesn't mean you don't use them for BPH or you don't use them in combination with other things, but clearly as a single drug, we can do harm. The other three arms, though, however, continued to the end of the study and were safe. However, here's the data of the primary outcomes. There was no difference between which car you drive. Whether you drive a thiazide, an ACE inhibitor or a CCB. In this case, lisinopril, amlodipine, or the long-acting diuretic chlorthalidone. You get to this, the same point. There was no difference. With one caveat, and a very important caveat. Remember, this is the general population. There was a significant number of African Americans that were included in the All Hat trial, which is tremendous. And the investigators are to be credited for doing that. However, we've known for many years that our African-American population tends to be salt-sensitive, meaning their blood pressure rises when you give them a sodium load. And they tend to be low renin, have lower activity of the renin angiotensin system, and they respond to a, a less well to ACE inhibition as single drug therapy. Their blood pressure only goes down about half of our Caucasian population. And that did happen in the All Hat trial. And that was, that was evident. It didn't appear to amount to out adverse outcomes, nevertheless, that data was clear. And that data was, should have been expected. So the JNCA committee asked the question, which car are we going to drive? Here's the answer. In our non-black population, you could choose either of the three. A thiazide, an ACE inhibitor, or a CCB as first-line therapy. In our African-American population, however, choose a thiazide or a CCB. Now remember, once you put the two together, whether you put a, an ACE inhibitor and a diuretic or an ACE inhibitor and a CCB in our African-American population or our Caucasian population, now the blood pressure goes down the same. So we're only talking about single therapy, the first, the, the first car you get into. If you're going to switch cars or add another car or tow another one, then once you use agents from the different classes, then the blood pressure goes down equally between Caucasians and African Americans. What about the other drugs? It was interesting. The JNCA committee did look at the type of thiazide. In this case, they actually considered chlorthalidone, possibly as a recommend as the recommended thiazide because of its duration of action and because it was used more often in the evidence-based trials, but they did not make that recommendation. They did not feel that the evidence was sufficient enough. However, if you have a choice, I would probably use chlorthalidone. Just remember it's twice as potent, so use half the dose. But it's longer acting. On the other hand, that, was not, that did not come forth from the JNC8. But they thought about it. In, but what about the other agents? And here's where we get back to beta blockers. Beta blockers were not recommended as first-line therapy, as you can see. And the issue is there's 
Uh, there is less evidence-based medicine with beta blockers. Remember, beta blocker was not included in the all hat trial. I go to bed just wishing we could do that one again and include a beta blocker because I don't know what the answer would be. But there is evidence to suggest that beta blockers do not reduce the risk of stroke as well as the other classes of agents. Uh, it's weak evidence, but nevertheless, it's concerning. So for that reason, beta blockers are not recommended as first-line therapy. Now again, when you're combining medications together, all bets are off. And again, what about the sympatholytics, the other CCBs, et cetera? Well, because there wasn't evidence-based medicine, side effect profiles, et cetera, there's no recommendations for the other agents. So let's wrap this up and let's conclude. Our deputies and together, we're all deputized. There's been a paradigm shift in the way recommendations are forthcoming. And JNC8 was one of the first for that shift. The new JNC8 recommendations are based on differing premises, differing charges. They're based on critical questions, not a book chapter of the disease state, if you will. And they're based on, as much as possible, evidence-based medicine. And even using evidence-based medicine as much as JNC8 used, and somewhat they've been faulted for, I think inappropriately and unfairly, they still only used evidence-based medicine 50% of the time. Half of JNC8 is, is expert opinion as well. It challenges our current thinking and dogma. We can't have it both ways. We have to decide. Do, you, do we want intuition, some art, some expert opinion, or do we want mostly evidence-based medicine? Little smattering of the intuition, art, and uh, and expert opinion. We have to decide, but we can't have it both ways. They do change the initial blood pressure treatments to start. They're higher, especially in our elderly populations, and our targets are higher to achieve in our diabetics, chronic kidney disease, and our elderly populations as well. And that's, that's just a difference, and it's a challenge for us to think, just to think about that, those differences. So I want to thank you very, very much for that. And I'll be happy to answer any questions specifically related to, to hypertension. And then we can move on to cholesterol. So do we have any questions, doctor? OK, right here. Yep. Oh, yeah. Please go to the microphone, and um, that'll help everyone to hear. Uh, they used lisinopril, but then they uh, recommended an arm in the same way as an ACE. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do that with uh, the uh, hydrochlorothiazide chlorothaladone. Right. So I, I don't, I'm not sure that I understand why they recommended an ARB without that evidence-based medicine. Right. There was, a, there was, there's evidence-based medicine with ARBs in our diabetic population, our renal insufficient population that they preserve GFR, etc. So there is extended data with our ARBs, but you're correct. If you're looking for a hypertension-based trial, specifically with an ARB, the data is lacking, but there now is sufficient evidence with ARBs in heart failure, diabetes, renal insufficiency, et cetera, uh, to, to support that conclusion, that they're, they're similar, if not equal to, uh, ACE inhibition. And they're better tolerated. We have another question. Here, come up to the yeah, microphone. Please. And uh, no, we're going to take a break after uh, Dr. Petty's next lecture. And, was no. there Go any ahead. effort in any of these studies to account for the circadian rhythm in blood pressure? It's usually much higher in the early morning and drops during sure. the afternoon. And that's, a, that's an excellent question. More importantly, there's evidence to suggest that the nocturnal blood pressure also conver uh, conveys prognosis. And there's dipping versus non-dipping in our hypertensive population. Some in the, normally, our blood pressure goes down at night. They dip, it dips, and in some individuals with hypertension and other disease states, they do not dip and the blood pressure stays elevated at night. So that, for m many reasons, that's an excellent question. They did not. And the reason they considered it, and they, I'm sure that they discussed it, however, there's no evidence-based medicine that targeting the time of day, of uh, AM versus PM, or specifically targeting circadian rhythm of blood pressure, to the best of my knowledge, the, those studies have not been done. And the one I am aware of uh, with verapamil, a unique formulation of verapamil, was negative. Uh, but nevertheless, that's something that we need to be cognizant of. Uh, I think what they would say if we had the committee here is they would say truly at least use 24-hour you know, blood pressure duration drugs uh, as much as possible. And I think that's where we discuss, we can discuss hydrochlorothiazide, which is about 12 hours, 
versus chlorothaladone, which is 24 hours-ish. Although we're sleeping at night, we're not eating a sodium load with hydrochlorothiazide, it might be less important. You want to take one more question? Sure. The, the cholesterol guidelines should be shorter. Okay. If, if not, um, we'll, we'll, well move again. Well, thank you very, very much for this piece. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Randy. Yeah.